Good morning, and welcome to Central Presbyterian Church's online worship service for this Sunday, December 6th, 2020. I'm your lay reader, Zach Cosner. Um, I ask you to download the bulletin for today's service, which can be found at the link uh, below this video on Facebook and on YouTube, or you can head to our website, www.centralprespb.com. Look for the publications link on the top of the webpage. Scroll down until you see the, bullet, uh, the date for today's service. Uh, you can go ahead and click on that date and it'll download the bulletin for you. Uh, now that you have access to the bulletin, we ask you that you turn uh, go ahead and turn uh, to the final page of the bulletin for the announcements. Um, just for this one last week, it is stewardship season. Pledge cards should, be, uh, should have been received um, over the last couple of weeks. Please return them via mail before the end of the month or uh, before the end of the week uh, so the session can build our 2021 budget and we do appreciate it. Uh, the session of Central Press has decided to stick with virtual services for the foreseeable future. Keep in contact with us via social media at username Central Press PB or our website for announcements that about any special services and when we plan to resume in-person in -person worship services. Uh, let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship the Lord. Among the poor, among the proud, among the persecuted, among the privileged, Christ is coming to make all things new. In the private house, in the marketplace, in the wedding feast, in the judgment hall, Christ is coming to make all things new. With a gentle touch, with an angry word, with a clear conscience, with a burning love, Christ is coming to make all things new. That the kingdom might come, that the world might believe, that the powerful might stumble, that the humble may be raised, Christ is coming to make all things new. Within us, without us, among us, before us, in this place, in every place, for this time, for all time, Christ is coming. Christ is coming to make all things new. Jesus is able for all time to save those who approach God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Please join me in the prayer of confession that is printed in your bulletin, first in unison and then silently. God of all ages, you are coming in power to bring all nations under your rule. We confess that we have not expected your kingdom, for we live, live, we live casual lives, ignoring your promised judgment. We accept lies as truth, exploit neighbors, abuse the earth, and refuse your justice and peace. In your mercy, forgive us. Grant us wisdom to welcome your way and to seek things that will endure when Christ comes to judge the world. And now silently. Amen. The good news in Christ is that when we face ourselves in God with the awareness of our need, we are given grace to grow, encouraged to continue the journey. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Now let's go ahead and turn it over to uh, Rose for a children's sermon with her Christmas tree. Good morning, everyone. Today is the second Sunday in Advent. Listen to the words of Isaiah. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill brought low, and the crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed. Our lists are long, even in this strange mess where we live these days, and we want to do it right. We want to be safe but we want to be able to enjoy the season. We've got work to do to put right what has gone wrong, to heal what is broken, to mend the relationships, and to prepare for the company that will come. The prophet Isaiah reminded us that there is work to be done. Prepare the way of the Lord and make straight in the desert a highway for our God. When God comes in, then healing is to be found. 
but we need to make the way. We need to open the door into our lives. So today we light these two Advent candles as a sign of our faith that the God we worship is not far from us and that we can clear the way for that God to come and dwell in us. We light these candles in faith that company is coming. Thanks, Rose, for that great children's sermon. Now let's go ahead and turn it over to Reverend Tim Reeves for this week's sermon, Prepare the Way. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Our first reading this morning comes from the 40th chapter of the prophet Isaiah, beginning with verse 1 and proceeding through verse 11. Let us listen for the word of the Lord. Comfort, O oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, Cry out, and I said, What shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. But, or when the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings, Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up. Do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. We turn now to our second reading from the second letter of Peter, beginning in the third chapter at verse 8 and proceeding through the first half of verse 15. Again, let us listen for the word of the Lord. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry. But do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that the Lord one day, or that with the Lord one day, is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to become, or all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved with fire, and the earth, and everything that is done on it will be disclosed. Since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, what sort of persons ought you to be in leading lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which 
the heavens will be set ablaze and dissolved, and the elements will melt with fire. But in accordance with his promise, we wait for new heavens and a new earth, where righteousness is at home. Therefore, beloved, while you are waiting for these things, strive to be found by him at peace without spot or blemish, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. And finally, from the first chapter of the Gospel according to Mark, beginning with the first verse and proceeding through verse 8. Again, let us listen for the word of the Lord. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Open now our hearts and minds, O God, by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, so that as your word is proclaimed this day, we may hear with joy what it is you would have us hear, that hearing we might believe, and that believing we might live lives of richer and fuller service, glorifying you here on earth, as you are glorified in heaven. Amen. What sort of persons ought you to be in leading lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming day of God? Those words by Peter are a call to reflection and self-examination which all Christians would do well to consider each and every day of our lives. In light of God's grace bestowed on us, God's love shown to us, and God's claim made on us, what sort of people ought we to be? As is so often the case, context dictates how we will answer that question. What sort of people ought we to be in this season of Advent, this season of darkness, of waiting and hoping? While we live in our lives in the midst of a culture obsessed with instant gratification, what sort of people ought we to be when, in spite of our best efforts and intentions to remember the real reason for the season, we nevertheless feel the temptation to succumb to the rampant consumerism and commercialism all around us? What sort of people ought we to be when all the lights and decorations and trappings of the seasons say that this is the most wonderful time of the year, but so many people are experiencing it just as the opposite. I'm reminded of a poem by Anne Weems entitled Yesterday's Pain, where she writes, some of us walk into Advent 
tethered to our unresolved yesterdays. The pain still stabbing, the hurt still throbbing. It's not that we don't know better, it's just that we can't stand up anymore by ourselves. On the way to Bethlehem, will you give us a hand? What sort of people ought we to be in leading lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming day of God? We need look no farther than, or for an answer than our readings from Isaiah and Mark to know what sort of people we are called to be. We are to be heralds of the good news of the coming of God. Last week, the prophet Isaiah pleaded with God to rip open the heavens and come down. This morning's reading builds on that theme. In ways large and small, God rips open the heavens and comes to our broken and beloved world. And we are called upon to bear witness to that great and glorious news. To quote from Ann Weems again, it is our great privilege to announce our God is the one who comes to us in a burning bush, in an angel's song, in a newborn child. Our God is the one who cannot be found locked in a church, not even in the sanctuary. Our God will be where God will be with no constraints, no predictability. Our God lives where our God lives, and destruction has no power, and even death cannot stop the living. Our God will be born where God will be born, but there is no place to look for the one who comes to us. When God is ready, God will come, even to a God-forsaken place like Bethlehem. Watch, for you know not when God comes. Watch that you might be found whenever, wherever God comes. So we are to be heralds of God's coming kingdom, but we are also to be preparers of the way for the Lord's coming. We are, to use the words of the theologian Reinhold Niebuhr, to be about the business of comforting the afflicted and afflicting the comfortable. Which means that like John the Baptist, we are both to call people to repentance and to point beyond ourselves to the author of our salvation. We are to confront the powers of sin and death in all of their guises and incarnations and to proclaim the one whose coming signals their defeat. Now that may not make us popular. I dare say that no one wants to admit that we have done wrong. No one likes acknowledging that we all deserve God's judgment and condemnation. We do not enjoy confessing our sins of omission and commission. That's part and parcel of afflicting the comfortable. If on Christmas Eve, we are to celebrate with any conviction that Christ the Savior is born, then surely we must all come to terms with the truth that we all need a Savior. As we prepare the way, however, we are also to be like the prophet Isaiah, who comforted the afflicted, who comforted everyone tethered to their unresolved yesterdays, where the pain still stabs and the hurt still throbs. Today, the word comfort tends to conjure up images ranging from recliners to cruises. Comfort food is all about the personal satisfaction that can come from our favorite meal. 
creature comforts are all about having nice things around us. Even as the words luxury and comfort are all about having the best in life. Comfort connects to all that is warm and fuzzy and satisfying. So we don't usually connect the idea of comfort with strength or power, but that's what comfort literally means, with strength or with power. Comfort for us is putting our feet up after a hard day of work, enjoying a fire crackling on the hearth. Comfort for us is a soft concept. It is not a working word. But when God says to Isaiah, comfort my people, these are words of command. They are working words. That was the prophet's task at hand, to announce an end to exile. Unless we think that that would have been an easy task, we need to remember the utter defeat and despair that the prophet would have been up against. The 137th Psalm reminds us, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and there we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs and our tormentors asked for mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How could we sing the Lord's song? in a foreign land. And then there are these words from Lamentations, how lonely sits the city that once was full of people. How like a widow she has become, she that was great among the nations, she that was a princess among the provinces has become a vassal. She weeps bitterly in the night with tears on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, she has no one to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. Judah has gone into exile with suffering and hard servitude. She lives now among the nations and finds no resting place. Her pursuers have all overtaken her in the midst of her distress. Jerusalem sinned grievously, so she has become a mockery. All who honored her despise her, for they have seen her nakedness. She herself groans and turns her face away. Her downfall was appalling, with none to comfort her. O oh Lord, look at my affliction, for the enemy has triumphed. And it is in this context of this defeat and despondency and despair that Israel lived for 50 years with no one to give them comfort. And now that silence was coming to an end. God told to the prophet Isaiah to inform the people that God was coming with might and mercy to shepherd God's flock once again. But before God would come, the people had to be prepared. There were valleys in need of being lifted up, and there were mountains in need of being made low. There was uneven ground in need of leveling, and rough places which needed smoothing. In short, every obstacle which stood in the way had to be removed so that God's glory might be revealed, and God's people might see it. So Isaiah was sent by God to do the work of comforting, giving strength to God's people. He sings a song of comfort to a confused and scattered people. He speaks with tenderness to a people that has endured much. Double the grief for their sins, known and unknown. He reminds them that God's word and love stand forever and are not transitory like flesh and grass. He reminds them that after all that has happened to them, the covenant between God and God's people still stands. 
in these dark days, we are not a nation in exile. But I believe an argument can be made that we are a people in exile. Far removed from those we love because of a pandemic. Unable to gather in person and celebrate our faith. Uncertain of what the future holds. And yet we are sent to prepare the way for the Lord, fully aware that there are valleys still in need of being lifted up. Be they valleys of depression or despair or loneliness or grief. There are mountains to be brought low, be they mountains of bigotry, distrust, hatred, or apathy. There is uneven ground to be leveled and rough places to be made plain, be they oppression, injustice, immorality, or idolatry. There's still work to do. And as we wait for new heavens and a new earth where righteousness is at home, we are to be the sort of people actively involved in preparing the way for the Lord. Yes, the valleys are awfully low, but no place is so low that it is bereft of God's love. And the mountains are awfully high, but there is no place so high that it is bereft of God's love. Yes, the uneven ground is treacherous, and while there may be places where angels fear to tread, there is no place so treacherous where God is afraid to tread. No resistance is great enough to thwart the will of God. Yes, there are those who are tethered to their unresolved yesterdays where the pain still stabs and the hurt still throbs. But the King of kings and Lord of lords is approaching. And we are to prepare the way. To God be all the honor, glory, and praise forever. Amen. I would ask now at this time that you would please join me and confirm what it is we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed that can be found in your bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. It is now, let us now return to God our thanksgiving through our tithes and offerings, which will be taken electronically. Uh, you can head to our website, www.centralprespb.com, look for the Donate Now link at the top of the webpage, and make your tithe electronically. If you prefer, you can also mail in your pledge, or your tithe, excuse me, uh, to 6300 Trinity Drive, Pine Bluff, Arkansas, 71603. It is right and our greatest joy to give you thanks, eternal God, for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. But we are most grateful for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, for, and for your abiding and sustaining Holy Spirit. For our Lord reconciled us to you and to one another, opening the door to eternal life. Your Holy Spirit continues to confront us, convict us, correct us, and equip us to enter the world and share the good news of your redeeming grace. And so, O oh God, we offer up our time, our talents, our treasures, and indeed our very selves for you to use as you see fit. Until that most glorious day when at the name of Jesus, every knee, every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth shall bend, and every tongue shall confess him more to your honor and glory. Amen. Let us now uh, at this time joy, share our joys and concerns, which there are uh, several. Uh, Dale Chambliss, who we've been praying for the last several weeks for um, because of his COVID-19 diagnosis, uh, was released to do uh, half-day work days um, this past week, so that is definitely a blessing. 
Um, Al Druitt, uh, who is Pat Druitt's brother-in-law, got a stage four cancer diagnosis this week. So we ask that you continue to keep um, uh, Mr. Druitt in your prayers. Um, Shirley Keir, who is a friend of Jane Judkins, got a COVID diagnosis and uh, has been diagnosed with pneumonia. Uh, she uh, worked for them at Keepsakes, but has moved uh, to Clarksville, I believe. Uh, please keep Ms. Keir in your, um, in your prayers. Um, Miranda Hayes, who is actually uh, also a, a member of the Von Tunglin family, uh, got a COVID diagnosis this week. We ask that you continue to keep her in your prayers. Uh, we ask that you keep Ms. Jane Glover, who is a neighbor of uh, Laura and mine, um, in your prayers. She's recovering from uh, hip surgery. Um, we ask that you continue to keep my Aunt Brenda Greenham in your prayers. We also ask that you keep Anita Rodriguez and also uh, Brad Von Tunglin in your prayers. Uh, let us uh, pray. Holy and gracious Father, we give you thanks that the Lord Jesus Christ is in fact the same today as he was yesterday and will be for all of our tomorrows. Uh, please keep those individuals that we just mentioned in your caring uh, with their various medical ailments. We ask that you provide the doctors with the wisdom and the knowledge to treat them effectively, uh, healing them and uh, getting rid of all uh, illnesses. Uh, we also ask that you keep the first responders, our medical professionals, and those who are in retail settings in, um, in your caring, that you provide a hedge of protection over them from this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we also ask that you be with those, uh, heal those who, all of those who have uh, contracted COVID-19. Uh, we also ask that you be with those who lost loved ones uh, to this horrible pandemic. Uh, that you uh, give them uh, comfort and uh, grace to get through these troubling days. Uh, we also ask that you reconcile our world and our nation to you and to your will, that we may be able to discern what you it is that you would have us do, and that we uh, pr have the courage and the and the the fortitude to uh, to do those things. Give us hope as we strive to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, as we forgive our debts. Uh, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Excuse me. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now go out into the world in peace, to love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power and the presence of God's Holy Spirit taking today's message with you, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.